just in case. All right, so, so now in the next uh, hour, we basically talk about causality in the setting of medical imaging. And uh, initially, let me, let me start with a little bit of, of a, taking a step back and talking about what do we actually do. Uh, and I guess if you look at the Mikai papers over the last couple of years, a lot or probably 90% of the papers are about predictive modeling. So what we are trying to do is to build predictive models that take images and then use maybe a, a, a training data set uh, over those images with some annotations. So X and Y here, uh, X the images, Y the annotations. And we basically try to build a model that approximates this distribution, right? So a conditional distribution, given an image, can we predict uh, a, a corresponding annotation Y, for instance, a disease label. But this also applies to tasks like image segmentation. Now here we're making already uh, very um, important assumptions. First of all, we, will, we, we assume that there is uh, training data available and that there's sufficient training uh, data available, basically pairs of X and Y that we can use to fit the or train, learn the parameters of our underlying model. And we also assume that training and test data come from the same distribution. Otherwise, uh, this learned uh, model doesn't really work at test time. Now, uh, taking a step back or taking a causal perspective on this whole idea of doing predictive modeling, uh, let me very quickly again uh, remind you of some background about causal reasoning. We have seen this in the first uh, lectures, uh, especially by Kayan on the graphical models, that basically in the most simple case, we assume that there's a cause and there's an effect in, in causal reasoning. And we can draw this very simple diagram here with an arrow indicating that uh, what is the cause and what is the effect. And we call this uh, the, the transition from cause to effect a mechanism. Now there's an underlying principle in causality, which we will come back to uh, a bit later, but just for now to remember that the idea is that we assume that there's an independence of the cause and mechanism, meaning this mechanism going from A to B exists uh, always in the same way and it's independent of actually how likely A, are, uh, a alone is so the marginal over P of, uh, of A is independent of the uh, mechanism uh, P, uh, B given A. Now in a, in a healthcare setting, this could be for instance that a patient uh, shows up with some symptoms and these symptoms might indicate that uh, maybe because of some guidelines that, that our doctor is following might indicate that we have to do a certain diagnostic test. We might have this relationship for instance. Now, what, what we tried to understand uh, basically more than a year ago, we, we, we got interested in causality and how it relates to what we are doing in medical imaging and machine learning. We wanted to understand what the relationship is between images and annotations. And we haven't found much in the literature where people clearly discuss uh, this from a causal perspective. So the question here really is, are the images causing the annotation? So would we have a causal relationship where we are trying to predict the effect from the cause, right? So remember, we're interested in this conditional distribution here, given the image, what's the probability of the label? Or are we looking at an anti-causal setting where the annotation is causing the image? So are we trying to predict the cause from the effect? Remember, the conditional distribution is still the same, right? So we're always trying to predict this. So we wanted to understand, are these two settings, causal and anti-causal, actually there in medical imaging? And so, so we thought uh, about a few examples. So here's skin lesion classification. And I want you to get ready uh, on the chat because I want to do a quick poll um, to see whether we can figure out together what the causal relationship is here. So get ready so that you can type something. Uh, so basically you have to type either causal or anti-causal. And the question is, given a demoscopic image in skin lesion classification, and a biopsy derived diagnosis. So that's our anti uh, annotation. What do you think is, is between X and Y, is it a causal or an anti-causal relationship? And because I can't see the chat, I need either Nick or Daniel or someone to, to jump in and tell me what, what, you, what your feeling is, what the, what the majority of people think. Is there a vote for causal, one for anti-causal? Another one for causal, anti. Okay, so it's a mix. So apparently it's not entirely clear. I tell you what we believe. We, we, we said this is an anti-causal relationship. Why? Because if you look at the, the data generating process, so if you think about how this image comes together, there's an underlying disease, 
and the disease causes how the image looks like, how these uh, skin lesions look like. And, and the biopsy-derived diagnosis is probably something that can get as close as possible to the true disease status. So, so that's why we think if we are predicting from image to disease, it's actually an anti-causal setting. Now, what about brain tumor segmentation? So the input is a structural brain MRI, and our labels are manually drawn from this. What do you think is the causal or anti-causal relationship? Maybe then you can try to get a consensus again. Any impressions? Okay, well, almost overwhelmingly causal, one vote for anti-causal. So I guess after an anti-causal example, there has to be a causal example. Um, so so we, we believe, and, and this is up for discussion and would be really interesting to hear people's thoughts about this. We, we think it's clearly a, a case of causal relationship between uh, the images and the annotations because the annotations are directly an effect from someone actually drawing contours on the image. Now, there's still an underlying disease, right? So in this case of glioblastoma here taken from the Bratz challenge, there's a disease that causes how the image looks like. But if you are predicting the segmentation, that's an effect of the image because someone has basically drawn this contour. So we are ba basically trying to replicate the manual process here. That's why we think this is a causal relationship. Now, here's another example, radiology reports. Chest X-ray is our image and diagnosis extracted from report is our label. What do you think is the relationship here? Um, so, I, so I assume, hopefully, on this one, people will like, like, be very, very mixed. Uh, some might say causes, some might might say anti causes. So, so let me tell you here that that we are not sure. So, so this is interesting because here we are basically lacking important meta information that that you do need to establish the causal relationship. That goes back to the question with Kayan is, where's the domain knowledge coming in? How, how do we know what the causal relationship is? This is not something we can observe from the data, and definitely not from observational data. We need to, someone to tell us, and we need to trust that person <laughs> that they have the expertise to tell us. Now, the reason here why it could be unclear is the diagnosis could be directly derived from the image, right? So someone might look at the image and say, this is the diagnosis. But the diagnosis in the report might also come from a lab result or something that is even, even more important or independent of the image. So that's why it's not clear with just giving that information what the causal relationship is. And that's our whole point here. So, so we want to emphasize that. So if you look at most of the papers currently, we are looking at trying to predict or trying to model these mechanisms going from an input to an output. And we are having a very, very narrow view, a limited view on the whole data generating process. So we might take images, we might try to predict different types of things. We might try to predict patient characteristics. We have seen uh, things like going from brain MRI to the age of a patient. Uh, we might do image segmentation. We, we might do automated uh, diagnosis. However, there's much more around that. And, and that's what causality is about to basically model this data generating process. And there are lots of things that go on before you actually get an image. Right, and, and, and this, what's going on around that, uh, the type of acquisition you're doing, the demographics of your patient population will all have effects uh, on, on your resulting image. And, and it's important to, to consider this. And, and these are the challenges that we're dealing with. So for instance, the acquisition shift is a big one. There are lots of Mikhail papers this year talking about domain adaptation, robustness and so on. So, so we do believe causality matters in this aspect, uh, and we will be talking about the key challenges that we see where causality can, can help us. Let me just quickly talk about data scarcity, which is the typical problem in our field of not having enough uh, annotated data. So labeled data is scarce. Unlabeled data, however, is often abundant. It's relatively easy to get medical images without annotations. So that's where people come in with semi-supervision, right? So can we leverage unlabeled data? And here's an interesting observation. If you talk about semi-supervised learning, because uh, the, the direction of causality might actually matter. So remember we said there, is, there can be a causal direction and there can be an anti-causal direction. Now, if we are in an application where we are trying to uh, learn uh, uh, the model, the mechanism that goes from cause to effect, so remember that this, for instance, image segmentation, now, causality theory tells us that there is this cause, the P of X, right? So the marginal distribution over the images and the mechanism that we are trying to learn and that the two are independent. Now, what this means right, from a theoretical point of view is that this P of X is uninformative 
for this conditional distribution. So this could mean that actually semi-supervised learning shouldn't work in image segmentation. However, we do see quite quite a few image, uh, quite a few papers at Mikai and other other venues talking about how, how to utilize semi-supervised learning in image segmentation. So maybe that's an interesting one to to discuss. Uh, causality also helps you to understand, for instance, why data augmentation works, because data augmentation actually tries to synthetically generate these new pairs with realistic perturbations, and it's try it's basically adding uh, pairs to the joint distribution x of y, right? So, so that might be less uh, dependent on the causal relationship. And that's why we often see data augmentation just works in so many different uh, scenarios. So, so this is from me. So Daniel will now take over uh, and talk about another big challenge, which is a population shift, prevalence shift in general, whenever we have data set mismatch. So Daniel, over to you. Okay, let me try to share my screen now. Um, right, are we seeing my slide? Cool. Um, yeah, so thanks, Ben, for the for the presenting the first part of the general framework. Um, now we're going to have a look at um, a specific kind of data mismatch, that's data set shift. As we'll see later, the two main processes that can produce differences between the distributions of your training data and your target um, your target environment data. Um, so the first one is data set shift. Here we're defining this as um, the scenario where the differences are caused by exogenous factors. So say, for example, if you have um, different cohorts or different hospitals, say, um, or maybe the, the scanners are different, you know, for example, um, you know, for MRI, even with the same uh, modality like T1 weighted, you can get very strong differences between uh, between data acquired from different hospitals, different centers. And actually, uh, what we have realized is that looking causally at the data generating process lets us actually disentangle uh, different kinds of mechanisms that produce uh, this data set shift. Uh, now, just kind of returning to that. Um, brain tumor segmentation example that uh, Ben talked about, um, we have, uh, I assume we have, we're acquiring this with um, a research scanner, uh, high resolution with some uh, mostly adult population, right? And then, so here we can actually see from this diagram that we are introducing two different uh, processes. One of them is uh, here from the domain label to the disease, because if we're um, then applying this uh, model to a uh, more general population in a hospital, uh, what, uh, we may expect differences in the age distribution. And this causes uh, changes in the prevalence of the disease, uh, but also size and appearance of the brains and so on. And also if the, the scanner is different, then we can expect differences in, in, in resolution, maybe contrast, uh, noise, artifacts, and all of this. So we can and concisely represent this in a diagram like this. Remember that we're predicting image uh, to segmentation, and then the, this domain label affects disease and image. Now we can uh, expand this to analyze all of these uh, different scenarios. And here the key is that in order to properly uh, understand the process, we also need to introduce new variables. The one I already mentioned is this domain indicator D, which is just say zero and one for training domain, test domain. So maybe if you have data from a, a motor site study, uh, this domain could indicate each hospital where the data was acquired from. And then crucially, we also need to add another variable Z, which represents the anatomy. So there is some ground truth that we can't directly observe, which is the, the actual uh, patient's body. And then we are measuring that, we're acquiring an image that gives us some description of that. So in some sense, it's like a proxy for the, um, for the anatomy. And then if we consider causal tasks, so we have X, the image, causes the annotation. The anatomy causes the image, but then the, the label is derived from the image. So we, we have this kind of linear uh, Z, X, Y uh, causal path here. Now, if the domain variable affects the distribution of 
anatomies. So we have this distribution P of Z different from, uh, in each site. We're calling this population shift. So this can be differences in uh, ages, sex distributions, or maybe diets, habits, ethnicities, genetics, environmental factors, uh, and things like that. Now, if the, the domain affects the X, so here is the difference in the distribution of X given Z. So remember that we have this unobserved anatomy, X is a measurement of that. So we're calling this acquisition shift. And these are the, the kinds of differences that are produced by difference in contrast, resolution, and so on, uh, as I explained. And Daniel, quick interruption. Yes. Uh, there are some audio problems with the mic, so sometimes it goes lower and higher in volume. I don't know if it's something that you can like just like move a little bit, or maybe maybe it helps. Yeah. Unplug this. Maybe it's using the microphone. Is that better? I think so. Yeah. Go ahead, and I, I, I'll tell you. All right. Um, so here, I think it's very interesting that we are able to actually uh, distinguish these two cases because. Um, when we see say, all of this Mikai, uh, amazing work on, on domain adaptation, um, we rarely see uh, a distinction of what kinds of differences we're actually trying to correct for. Um, and actually, these are very distinct things. So are we, is this a difference actually in the cohorts that are being imaged or just in the acquisition process? And I think that it's really helpful that we are able to separate these two and maybe address them uh, separately. Um, Finally, and for this kind of causal scenario, we can also have differences in the annotation process. So at the same image may tend to be annotated differently uh, in each site or in a training domain and test domain. Um, so this can be either due to a difference in annotation policy, which is not often the case if you have, for example, an international study. Um, of, of course, there, there, there may be efforts to try to harmonize these things, but it's very hard to be 100% sure that um, the annotation is happening exactly the same. Uh, we can also have differences in annotator experience, or so maybe some radi radiologists have had um, more training for a particular task than others. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we have we can identify these different cases. And for anti-causal, so now remember that we're trying to predict something that um, affected the image. So this can be either patient characteristics or some diagnosis label or things like that. Um, so we can have differences in uh, prevalence, for example, if the disease uh, happens more often uh, in, the, in one domain or another, um, which can be due to not just natural, the, the baseline prevalence in the different populations is different, but also this can be caused by uh, artificial means. So for example, often when we are doing some machine learning, we may want to oversample or undersample one class to, to try to uh, uh, balance things out but we may actually be introducing bias. So this is an interesting case also to look at. Uh, manifestation shift is one that is very tricky. So what, what do you do when actually the disease presents itself different or, or the target condition presents itself differently uh, across domains? Actually, maybe there's not much hope to, to learn much from, from uh, one population that can generalize to another one. And finally, acquisition shifts can also happen in, in this direction, but then, um, the, both the, the understanding of, of this uh, case and the solutions uh, are similar. So using these diagrams, we can kind of clearly communicate what our assumptions are about what changed and what is stable across domains. And obviously these are just like the individual cases uh, as we saw before in the, in the brain example, um, that can be combinations of these, right? And then we can think about how can, we, can address, uh, we, we can address them uh, individually. Now there's a second process that can also uh, produce um, data mismatch, which is sample selection. And this is the case where we have a single population, right? But um, our training data suffered some selection process, which may be a preferential selection process such that um, our sample is biased. So let's say, imagine, imagine here, this is the, the support of our uh, full population, and we have a, a, a subsample that may be biased. And crucially, the difference between sample selection and um, uh, data set shift is that these are data dependent changes in the data collection process. Whereas for data set shift, those were exogenous changes that happened uh, from you know, ex external uh, causes. So if you remember the um, 
skin lesion uh, example that Ben mentioned, um, we know that the patients, we don't take biopsies of everyone who comes in to the clinic. Right? We, we will only refer them for biopsy if the image looks suspicious in the first place. So that means that um, benign cases will be underrepresented in this data set. So this is the kind of thing that we want to be able to um, diagnose, just reasoning about the problem. Uh, and uh, as Faye mentioned, uh, these kinds of assumptions only, can only come from uh, domain knowledge. And we can indicate in the diagram here, uh, disease causes the image, and we're trying to predict in this direction. So it's an anti-causal task, but an image causes suspicion, and then we select on suspicion. And so the biopsies are collected for um, suspicious image, images. And likewise, we can identify different cases of uh, sample selection. We can have the ideal case, obviously, is uniform uh, sampling. So where the selection variable S here, so this represents whether an individual datum is included in the data set or not. Uh, if this is independent of the values of X and Y, this is perfect. This is uh, just uniform sampling and we get no bias. Uh, now, there are several processes that can, uh, uh, criteria that we can use to curate our data set that depend on the image. So for example, we'll be uh, selecting only cases that we know have visible lesions or with certain, uh, you know, lacking artifacts, noisy images, these sorts of things we may be trying to uh, um, create a high quality data set, but we need to be mindful that uh, by the very action of doing this selection, we may be biasing our, our predictor. We can also do selection based on the target variable. So as I mentioned, um, we can try to oversample or undersample some certain uh, classes artificially to try to balance the, uh, the distributions. Um, we, we, may, we may want to exclude certain cases and so on. And this produces a certain uh, bias that is similar to prevalence shift, as I mentioned. So uh, similar considerations to what we had already seen before can be applied in these cases, but uh, reasoning causally and drawing these diagrams lets us clearly identify which one's going on. And finally, if we're actually selecting on both inputs and outputs of our predictive model, then we have a bit more of a problem because now we're introducing what's classically known as selection bias, um, also related to Bergson's paradox uh, and other kind of classic problems uh, in statistics, which mean that if we're selecting on a collider here, um, where we have two arrows coming into the selection variable, then we're introducing other spurious correlations uh, beyond what we're actually interested in. So for this, we cannot correct for this bias unless we have other measurements to try to block this uh, path here. This relates to, to Kay and Stolperger. Um, now, to make this whole framework a bit more useful to the community, we formulated this uh, um, checklist um, of recommendations of kind of questions, um, basic questions that you should ask yourself when you first collect a data set, because there's often this uh, tendency to say, go on Kaggle, download a bunch of images, bunch of labels, and then just train the story in your network at it and be done with it. But uh, as we've argued, um, this, this doesn't tell the full story, right? We need to know what processes are involved, how the labels were collected, what kind of relationships between the images and the outputs that we want. Um, if there are other variables that are also involved that can uh, maybe bias this one way or another. So this is kind of a very basic uh, set of questions that you should ask. Um, and then at the end, you draw this diagram and it doesn't stop there. You need to reason about uh, using uh, those de-separation criteria and everything that Kian presented at the start uh, to really see, do these assumptions actually match my domain knowledge, right? And then if we identify any gaps, uh, if there's anything that uh, doesn't quite add up, we then iterate and then try to collect more information and so on and refine this understanding. And actually we believe that this very effort, uh, this exercise of building the full causal story of the data can hopefully encourage practitioners to be more thorough in identifying these issues um, that affect the external validity of their models, you know, generalizability. Um, finally, coming back to that diagram that uh, Ben showed earlier, this is a bit of a kind of scaffold or template diagram that we put together that more or less summarizes the most typical analysis scenarios that we see out there. Um, 
and this should be easy to customize uh, for specific applications. And we can add or remove uh, arrows or, or nodes uh, as required. And what's interesting here is that, as Ben mentioned, we often try to predict different things that have different relationships to the images. Uh, so here, for example, we can think of anti-causal uh, prediction targets. So these are, uh, say, pre-imaging them to parallel uh, pre-treatment and post-treatment as is used in, in epidemiology. So here's the image at the very center. And things that uh, are not consequences of the image, like the annotations or the referral, uh, we consider them anti-causal. So say patient characteristics, uh, say demographics, genomics, but also uh, histopathology results, like for the um, skin lesion classification task. And post-imaging are these causal tasks. So um, and they're predicting some sort of suspicion. For example, for um, screening is a super important uh, problem. Uh, this is, you know, look, look at the image. Is this suspicious? Do we need to have a closer look at this patient, right? Or other tasks such as localization, segmentation, and so on, um, which will be uh, or in this direction. And we can identify these paths up here with acquisition shifts. So if there are differences in the acquisition conditions, differences in the annotation condition, or difference in the uh, patient characteristics of these population shift or prevalence shift. Um, so, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully this gives an, an overview, an idea of, of what kinds of, of uh, formalizations we can we can apply to our problems. Now, finally, just to conclude, we showed that uh, causal reasoning can give us a better, uh, a new look at some of the key challenges in, in this field of, of medical image analysis, right? Uh, thinking systematically about these problems helps us identify some potential uh, bias pathways. Uh, it can sometimes inform our choice of learning strategies. So as Ben mentioned, um, maybe we want to think twice about, uh, or think more carefully about uh, the applicability of semi-supervised learning, which is something that we're um, encouraging the community to uh, look into and validate whether this makes sense or not, or if we have missed something in this analysis, because this is a more uh, conceptual uh, result. Uh, hopefully, this also empowers people to um, do some more transparent reporting. So if we include this kind of diagram in uh, our papers, so for example, if we collected a new data set to do a performance study uh, for a new method, uh, we may want to com communicate the data generating process that we're assuming uh, so that these assumptions are very clear and transparent and then make it easier for other uh, colleagues and readers to then uh, analyze and then scrutinize whether these assumptions make sense. And then also, once we formalize our problem domain uh, under these causal assumptions, this, this clear, uh, let's say, formal language of, of um, causality, that opens the door then for new applications. So things like um, causal inference, like Kristen presented, um, causal discovery even, that's something that's a bit more far-fetched, but it's also super exciting uh, domains of like biomarker discovery and all these kind of things. Um, but also as uh, Nick and KM will present next, uh, we can think about counterfactual prediction and uh, potential applications. So we're looking forward to their talks. And just to uh, a bit of a plug here, if you thought this, this talk was interesting, we discussed uh, these concepts and causal reasoning and how to think about these challenges in a lot more detail with more examples and then and more recommendations uh, in our paper that came out in Nature Communications just a couple of months ago. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much. I think we can open up for questions. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we, we will move the uh, Q&A to after the counterfactual session. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, we, we're moving straight on to, to Nick and Kian. But, uh, but it was very clear that your talk uh, started to uh, get the chat going. There's, uh, there's already a heated debate about causal and anti-causal settings, the segmentation example, and so on. Uh, so this will be great. Uh, so now next is Nick. And without losing much time, over to you talking about counterfactual. Thanks. <laughs> 